back with another video this is for sean little he wanted me to talk about and review unsolved mysteries season one episode five and i know i haven't really talked about the show that much but it is a favorite of mine i mean obviously i didn't catch it when it was on tv uh, but you know later on watching the reruns uh you know robert stack was a great host and they did bring, you know they brought it back for a little bit there where you had Dennis Farina as the host, and this is probably around, you know, 2007, 2008. Uh, and, you know, Dennis Farina, you know, he was okay. I mean, obviously, you know, he's not Robert Stack, but uh, they brought it back for a little bit there. And now they have revived it for Netflix, which I haven't seen a single episode, you know, but to me, you can't really do it without Robert Stack. Um, Rest in peace to Robert Stack. You know, he was a great host that really added it to the original run of the series. And so, yeah, it was great to go back and, you know, watch this episode because I love the show. Uh, you know, it covered, you know, a little bit of everything, you know, from murders to the paranormal uh, and, you know, disappearances and all that stuff. And, you know, now you can find about every episode on YouTube or, you know, Tubi. Uh, so they're out there. I was able to watch this on YouTube. So, yeah, so today, like I said, for Sean Little, I'm going to review uh, Season 1, Episode 5 of the show. And they cover three stories here. And I'll do my best to talk about, you know, each story. Uh especially the first one, which is a very well-known uh, story. So, like I said, I'm going to do my best. I'm not going to, I'm probably not going to add a lot of insight, um, but, you know, I'll talk about, you know, talk about each one. And, uh, yeah, so give you a description. Uh, but here we go. Uh, but the first segment here for this episode talks about D.B. Cooper, uh, the famous hijacker and that story has always fascinated me uh, in fact that's how I heard I think it was this episode that's how I heard about the story of D.B. Cooper so you know I've seen this episode before but it's you know been a long time but it was interesting to go back and you know rewatch again because you know you know a lot of this stuff was filmed in the mid to late 80s uh, so it's not too long after the D.B. Cooper, uh, you know, hijacking. But to provide a little bit of context here, I'm going to read off right here. Uh, D.B. Cooper was an identified, an identified man who hijacked a Boeing 727 aircraft in the United States airspace on the afternoon of November 24th, 1971. Uh, the aircraft was operated by Northwest Orient Airlines and was flying from Portland, Oregon to Seattle, Washington. The hijacker extorted $200,000 in ransom, which equivalent to uh, $1.3 million in 2021. He asked to be flown to Reno, Nevada, then parachuted uh, to an uncertain fate over the southwestern uh, Washington Partway through the second flight. And later on, a small portion of the ransom was found along the banks of the Columbia River in 1980, which the episode does talk about and cover, which triggered renewed interest, but ultimately only deepened the mystery. The great majority of the ransom remains uncovered, unrecovered, that is. The man, the man purchased his airline ticket using the alias Dan Cooper, but because of the news miscommunication, he became known as the popular culture as D.B. Cooper. And, you know, to this day, which now it's been, what, 51 years? Say 50. They still don't know who it is. They still haven't, you know, recovered a body. Now, if you were to ask me, what do I think happened to the guy? Because, again, this is pretty much a, this is a well-known story. You know, everybody knows about the story of D.B. Cooper and, uh, you know, jumping out of an airplane and all that stuff. What do I think happened? Um, I have a feeling he made it. 
I, I did watch a documentary, I want to say probably about a year or two ago, about D.B. Cooper. And, yeah, but it's kind of, it's one of those documentaries that you see that we found new evidence and all, you know, how the way documentaries are hyped up now on television, but it's really nothing new. You know, they, I remember the documentary that I did watch in D.B. Cooper a couple of years ago, um, you know, they kind of speculated that it could be this guy or it could be that guy that maybe like they had three or four you know, guys that they were looking at that one of them could be D.B. Cooper. I don't think he, I don't think he's alive now. I mean, let's just, I don't think he's, I think he's dead, but I do think he made it uh, because again, they would have recovered a body, but it took what, nine years to recover the money along the banks. And yes, within those nine years, like, you know, within those nine years, he could have died and, uh, you know, his carcass would have been eaten up by, you know, bears or what have you. Uh, but, you know, I, but how far, you wonder how he made it. You know, let's say if he made it, he's going, he's walking through the forest in like a suit. <laughs> And he's carrying, I mean, you can survive if you carry the right tools. I mean, all you need is a pocket knife and flint. And I think even the episode, the segment talked about that. Some guy mentioned this Unsolved Mysteries episode. Yeah, if he, you know, carried, you know, one or two, one or two uh, of the right tools, he could survive in the wilderness. But I have a feeling that he may... But even so, but, okay, so I know I'm kind of rambling here a little bit. I'm babbling. If, if let's say he made it, there's no way he could spend the money because of the serial numbers. I think he, I think he made it, but, you know, he buried all the money somewhere. Um, so I don't know, I mean... Again, I'm not like the biggest follower of the story. Uh, you know, I didn't really, you know, do a lot of research. And like I said, you know, at the beginning of this review, I'm not going to really offer a lot of insight. But it makes me wonder, did he make it or not? And I have a feeling that he did make it. And like I said, obviously, I don't think he's alive today. I mean, you know, it's been 50 years, but... I still think there's some stuff out there yet to be recovered. Now, if I understand, the FBI has closed the case uh, because they want to focus on other priorities and what have you. Uh, but it's always been one of those mysteries that has fascinated me that 50 years later, we still can't, we don't know who it is. <laughs> we have recovered the mo some of the money. It took nine years, but there's been some stuff that's been recovered. And apparently, it, I think I saw somewhere that there was a something that he may have left on the plane or that they have found where there was a little bit of DNA on there. And again, if I could find that article, I'll put it down below in the description. So I'm like, okay, if you found DNA now, you know, with the advancements in DNA, why haven't we, you know, been able to find out who D.B. Cooper is? I mean, I know it's been 50 years, but I don't know, just to me, it's just one of those baffling mysteries. And again, I'm not going to, I can't really offer a lot of insight. I'm not the biggest follower on the case. I, mean, I haven't really studied the case or you know, looked in deep with the mystery of D.B. Cooper. But again, it's very fascinating. But I do think uh, if you want my opinion on the matter, my, you know, my final thought is I do think he made it. Uh, but I think he just buried all the money. I don't know. I don't think we'll ever know. 
Uh, but yeah, that's my <laughs> that's my take on the DB Cooper case. Now, the second segment of this episode talks about the bodies of 16-year-old Don Henry and 17-year-old Kevin Ives. Uh, they were hit by a cargo train in Arkansas as they laid on the tracks, their bodies. And the train driver attempted to stop. He blew the horn, but the momentum of the train carried carried over the bodies. And it took for a full, like, half mile for it to stop. So, yeah, as you can imagine, their bodies disintegrated. And it was later discovered during autopsy that uh, Don Henry and he had been stabbed in the back. Kevin Ives' skull had been crushed uh, prior to being run over. The deaths were initially ruled an accident, apparently the result of the boys uh, sleeping deeply on the tracks while intoxicated by marijuana. This is what they believed at first. Uh, the parents of the boys insisted on a second autopsy and it was ruled that the hom like homicide was likely and later another pathologist ruled that Don Henry's shirt uh, showed evidence of a stab wound. And yeah, this was a sad case. I mean, it, you know, why didn't the first time around, I mean, I get they had probably a hard time of, you know, trying to figure out what happened after the train had run over their bodies. And as, like I said, as you can imagine, the bodies, you know, when a train gets, you know, run over something like that, you know, two bodies, uh, it just everything just tears apart and they're trying to figure out you know what happened and you wonder why you know they didn't pick up like they didn't they didn't pick up the first time around that there was a stab wound or or what have you and the episode does talk about how you know witnesses say that there was a guy walking around in like military garb and there was one moment where this uh, police officer uh, was driving up on this guy in military garb and he turns around and he fires a weapon and then he disappears uh, you know never to be caught and I think even to this day there hasn't been really an update or you know no was no one's been captured uh, so it remains a, a mystery as to what happened to these guys I mean I believe that they were murdered and you know laid on the tracks to you know, make it look like, you know, they passed out due to marijuana. Uh, because, you know, like I said, the train coming and running over these bodies, uh, you know, you can't tell, you know, what happened. So I do think that there was homicide involved. I don't know why it took for a, a second examination to figure that out. But again, I know it's hard because once a, you know, train, you know, disintegrates bodies, I mean, it just, I feel bad for the parents. I mean, and like I said, I don't think, you know, to this day, there hasn't been an update. No one's been captured and it's a sad case. Uh, so, but yeah, you know, that, that was a sad story. But the last case here for this episode talks about Dennis Walker. And this took place in about yeah, 1980. Uh, but to get into that, I'm going to read off some information here. So 43-year-old Dennis Walker was a sports memorabilia collector who collected items belonging to Babe Ruth, Mickey Mantle, uh, Pete Rose, and others. Uh, his collection is valued at over $10 million. In June of 1980, uh, Walker started an investment company in his hometown of Medford, Oregon. He started a grandiose investment uh, schemes and, and even opened a bank on a South Pacific Island. Uh, more than 140 people gave Walker, you know, several million dollars to invest over the years. Uh, Walker's employees uh, trusted him and also invested with him. Uh, Walker uh, brought or bought uh, rare and expensive sports memorabilia uh, with his investors' money, and he started with buying baseball cards. But you know, soon began buying rare, expensive items. Uh, he leased a building in Medford 
and opened up a museum dedicated to sports memorabilia. And he even had Pete Rose there as a special guest for the museum's opening. And Walker had thousands of dollars worth of baseball cards, uh, baseball rings, and uniforms at the museum. In 1986, uh, Medford police obtained a search warrant for Walker's office. Uh, the state police were watching Walker for over a year, uh, suspicious of his activities, and he was charged with fraud and racketeering uh, based on the evidence they found. Uh, the authorities, however, had trouble uh, with the case because his investors did not believe that he was cheating them out of anything. Uh, none of none of the investors had ever complained about, you know, ever complained to the authorities. Walker even countersued the police. He had a number of summons, but never appeared in court. You know, Walker believed that the, the police would seize his collection. So, soon, uh, he and another code worker packed everything away. Uh, Walker left Medford in April of 1986 and vanished. Uh, 16 months later, on July 5th, 1987, a man by the name of Charlie Lee was found dead in the bathroom of a Las Vegas hotel. Authorities found a pill bottle on the counter with the name Dennis Walker. Uh, dental records confirmed that the dead man was Walker. A cause of death was not determined. It was still unknown if the death if the death was an accident, suicide or homicide. Authorities would like to determine how Walker died, and they would also like to find the rest of the collection. Now, apparently, they have found some of the collection. Uh, it says right here too that, as far as like suspects, uh, some have claimed that Walker was murdered in a mob hit. But no suspects, no suspects have been identified. As far as like extra notes, um, so it says the case was featured as a part of the October twelfth, nineteen eighty eight episode. Okay, so it talks about the episode of Unsolved Mysteries. Um, but the results, yeah, uh, to this day it remains unresolved. A total of one hundred twenty thousand of his collection has been located since his death, including Babe Ruth's uh, shirt and World Series ring. However, the rest has not been found, and Walker's cause of death has never been determined. So there you go. Again, interesting story. And I don't, you know, it was uh, interesting, but I don't have a lot of insight on that because, again, I, I never heard of the story, but uh, I don't know what happened. Maybe, you know, maybe it was a mob hit, but I can only speculate. Uh, but, you know, overall, this was a good episode of Unsolved Mysteries. Uh, you know, like I said, the stuff with D.B. Cooper uh, was fascinating. And, you know, I know I didn't really add a lot to that as far as, um, like, you know, more questions and what have you. But, you know, like I said, I do believe that somehow he made it and i don't think he's alive today um but that's just my two cents on that uh you know the second story was sad um again you know not finding you know the first time around that there was a stab wound or you know skull fracture uh again it's just a laziness on the authorities part and then you have a mystery here, you know, with the Dennis Walker case. So, yeah, like I said, overall, a good episode of Unsolved Mysteries. And I hope I, had a, I, hope I did a, you know, decent enough job uh, for Sean Little. Hope you enjoyed this. But thank you once again for watching and have a good day.